Uh, this is week four. Tonight is the Magna Carta 1215, which is the second genealogical document that our founders used uh, to uh, draw up the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. And uh, last, last week we went over the 1100's Charter of Liberty. 1100's Charter of Liberty um, gave us a process. Now, the Magna Carta 1215 gives us the law. You remember last week, one of the very first things in the 1100's Charter of Liberty was that uh, King Henry um, promised that to keep the other kings and queens of England from being evil and oppressive, one of the very first things he said is the king should keep himself out of the church. The king should not be involved in the church. So, we need to know a little bit of the history that brings us up to the Magna Carta. King John of England ruled uh, from 1199 to 1216 and he's gone down in, in history as one of the very worst of English kings, both for his uh, character and his failures. He lost the, uh, um, and I'm going to screw this up, it's French, the uh, Angevin uh, Plantagenet, Plantagenet, the Avention uh, Plantagenet lands in France, uh, and so crippled England financially. Uh, the barons rebelled and forced him to sign the Magna Carta uh, Charter of Liberties in 1215. The son of Henry II of England and Eleanor of uh, uh, Aquitaine, John succeeded his elder brother Richard I of England as king. Uh, the celebrated Magna Carta that he was obliged to sign, remember he signed it with a sword to his throat, um, limited royal power and emphasized the primacy of the law over all. So this is where the king, even though the king has a divine right to rule, the people have a divine right to liberty. And either all are under the law, or the law is unjust. And that's what the Magna Carta brings us. It's too bad we didn't know that today in today's politics, right? Um, uh, em emphasize the primacy of the law overall, including the monarchy. Following his death, while fleeing a French invasion force, King John was succeeded by his young son, Henry III of England. Now this is what really started the whole thing. King John was oppressive. Um, but in our, even in our Declaration of Independence, it says, All experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer evils, while evils are sufferable, rather than to right themselves and abolish the forms which they have been accustomed to, right? So even though King John was a scoundrel and he was evil, um, it got to a certain point that the, the straw that broke the, the uh, camel's back was this right here. King John may not have been talentless, but he was certainly manage, uh, managing to make himself one of the most unpopular kings in English history. He lost the lands in Normandy. Uh, he invented income tax and taxed the people of England harshly. John also upset the church after his refusal to endorse Stephen Langton for the post of Archbishop of Canterbury. So what had happened is the people had voted for their Archbishop, and they voted for uh, Stephen Langton. And King John didn't like Langton because Langton was a political rival of his. And so he didn't want Langton in that post as Archbishop, so he wouldn't recognize him and put his own Archbishop in. And that was the final straw. The dukes and earls said, no, we're done. Um, as Langton was the papal candidate, Pope Innocent III um, excommunicated John in November of 12, 1209 and ordered the closure of all churches. Uh, the idea that the king was chosen by God to rule, the so-called divine right of kings, was looking a little problematic for John to use as a basis for his authority now that the church had abandoned him. So he understood this idea that the kings have a divine right to rule, um, but he didn't quite get that the people have a divine right to liberty yet. So the Magna Carta was signed and sealed by King John June 15th, 1215 at Runnymede Meadow. Now again, this is all in Old English, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher a lot of words through here. John, by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy and Aquitaine, and Count of uh, Anjou, Anjou uh, to the archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, barons, uh, justices, foresters, sheriffs, 
uh, provost, serving men, and to all his bailiffs and faithful subjects, greetings. Know that we, by the will of God, and for the safety of our soul and the souls of all our predecessors and our heirs, uh, to the honor of God and for the exaltation of the Holy Church and the bettering of our realm, by the counsel of our venerable father, Stephen Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, notice who wrote this. Stephen Langton wrote this. And the barons supported him in it. So do you think John would have signed this with that in there, without a sword to his throat? Stephen Langton, by the, you know, was his political rival. Uh, Venerable Father Stephen, Archb uh, Stephen Archbishop of Canterbury, Primate of all England and Cardinal of the Holy Roman Church, of Henry Archbishop of Dublin, of the Bishops William of London, Peter of Winchester, uh, jo uh, Jocelyn of Bath and uh, Glastonbury, Hugo of Lincoln, Walter of uh, Worcester, William of uh, Coventry and Benedict of uh, Rochester, uh, of Master P Pandolf, subdeacon, and of the household of the Lord Pope, of Brother uh, Americ, uh, Master of the Knights of the Temple in England, and of the noble men, William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, William Earl of uh, Salisbury, William Earl of Warren, William Earl of uh, uh, Arundel, Alan de Galloway, Constable of Scotland, Warren, son of uh, Gerald, uh, Peter, son of Herbert, Hubert de, de, Burrow, uh, de Burr, uh, central of uh, post theaters, uh, Hugo de Neville, Matthew, son of Herbert, Thomas Bass Bassett, uh, Alan Bassett, Philip uh, de Auburny, uh, Robert de Ropele, <coughs> John Marshall, John, son of Hugo, and others of our faithful subjects. Boy, that's a a huge uh, uh, hello, isn't it? <laughs> Number one, first of all, have granted to God and for us and for our heirs forever have confirmed by this our present char uh, charter that the English church shall be free and shall have its rights intact and its liberties uninfringed upon and thus we will uh, that it be observed as is apparent from the fact that we spontaneously and of our own free will before dis, uh, discord broke out between ourselves and our barons did grant and by our charter confirm and did cause the Lord Pope Innocent III to confirm freedom of elections which is considered most important and most necessary to the Church of England which charter both we ourselves shall observe and we will that it be observed with good faith by our heirs forever we have also granted to all free men of our realm uh, on the part of ourselves and our heirs forever all the subjoined liberties to have and to hold to them and to their heirs from us and from our heirs. Okay, so remember, John got involved by, even though they had voted for Stephen Langton, <clears throat> he wouldn't recognize Stephen Langton and put his own archbishop in. Right here they're saying, no, the king doesn't have the ability to do that. That the king from here on henceforth cannot do that. That the king must keep himself free of the church. He cannot interfere in the church and what the people of the church vote for. Isn't that odd how it's number one? Number two, if any one of our earls, barons, or others holding from us in chief through military service shall die, and if at the time of his death his heir be of full age and owe relief, he shall have his inheritance by paying the old relief, the heir namely, or the heirs of an earl, by paying 100 pounds for the whole barony of an earl. The heir or heirs of a baron, by paying 100 pounds for the whole barony, the heir, of heir, the heir or heirs of a knight, by paying 100 shillings at most for a whole knight's fee, and he who shall owe less shall give less according to the ancient custom of fees. Number three, but if the heir of any of the above persons shall be under age and in uh, wardship, when he comes of age, he shall have his inheritance without relief and without fine. Four, the administrator of the land of such heir who shall be under age shall take none but reasonable issues from the land of the heir and reasonable customs and, and services, and uh, this without destruction 
uh, and waste of men or goods, and if we shall have committed the, uh, the custody of any such land to the sheriff or to any other man who ought to be responsible to us for the issues of it, and he caused destruction or waste to what is in his charge, we will find him, and the land shall be handed over to two lawful and discreet men of that fee who shall uh, answer to us or to him to whom we shall have referred them regarding those issues. And if we shall have given or sold to any one the custody of any such land, and he shall have caused destruction or waste to it, he shall lose that custody, and it shall be given to two lawful and discreet men of that fee, who likewise shall answer to us as has been explained. Five, the administrator moreover, so long as he may have the custody of the land, shall keep in order from the issues of that land, the houses, parks, warrens, lakes, mills, and other things pertaining to it, and he shall restore to the heir, when he comes to full age, his whole land stocked with plows and wainages, according as the time of the wainage requires, and the issues of the land will reasonably permit. So they weren't allowed to, if they were, if they were not of age to receive the land, they were supposed to work the land, and they were supposed to keep that stuff. They couldn't just come in and take all of that stuff and leave the heirs with nothing. They had to take care of it, um, so they were taking care of widows and orphans, which is what they were supposed to do. Six, heirs may marry without uh, uh, disparagement. So not, uh, nevertheless, that before the marriage is contracted, it shall be announced to the relations by blood of the heir himself. Seven, a widow after the death of her husband shall straightway and without difficulty have her marriage portion and her inheritance, nor shall she give anything in return for her dowry, her marriage portion or the inheritance which belonged to her and which she and her husband held on the day of the death of that husband, as she, uh, and she may remain in the house of her husband after his death for 40 days, within which her dowry shall be paid over to her. Eight, no widow shall be forced to marry when she prefers to live without a husband. So, however, that she gives security not to marry without uh, our consent, that she hold from us or the consent of the Lord from whom she holds, if she hold from another. Nine, neither we nor our bailiffs shall seize any revenue for any debt so long as the chattels of the debtors uh, suffice to pay the debt. Again, um, Michigan's running into this problem in our fifth, the fifth article of the, const, uh, the uh, Bill of Rights. It says that if the government seizes any of your property, they have to pay you fair market value for it. They can't just take your property. Uh, in Michigan, we had a situation where if people were late on their taxes, our uh, treasurer would uh, uh, go ahead and sell the property. But instead of, we had one property on the lake that was worth $30,000. The lady was $8 behind in her taxes. They seized the property. They sold the property for $30,000 and kept every penny. They didn't keep just the $8 in the cost of marketing the land. They kept it all. Well, now Hillsdale County happens to be in a class action lawsuit against that for the five years that they did that. So now they're going to have to pay back all of that money that they used uh, illegally. This is talking about the same thing, and this is where we get that idea in the fifth article of the Bill of Rights, that you can't just take the property. If you take the property, if it's seized, if it has to be taken, they're supposed to get back what is theirs. So it has to be fair. Nor shall the sponsors of the debtor be distrained so long as the chief debtor has enough to pay the debt. But if the chief debtor fail in paying the debt, not having the wherewithal to pay it, the sponsors shall answer for the debt. And if they shall wish, they may have the lands and revenues of the debtor until satisfaction shall have been given them uh, for the debt previously paid for him, unless the chief debtor shall show that he is quit in that respect towards those same sponsors. So again, we're looking at where it comes in the law where you have to be made whole if someone uh, causes you a problem in a civil suit, 
You can't just take everything they own. You can only get that which makes you whole. So we get this in the law in the Magna Carta 1215. And this is something that we see in our modern day law. 10. If anyone who has borrowed a sum of money from Jews dies before the debt has been repaid, his heirs shall pay no interest on the debt for so long as he remains under age, irrespective of whom he holds his lands. If such a debt falls into the hands of the crown, it will take nothing except the principal sum specified in the bond. 11. If a man dies owing money to Jews, his wife may have her dowry and pay nothing toward the debt from it. If he leaves children that are under age, their needs may also be provided for on a scale appropriate to the size of his holding, holding of lands. Uh, the debt is to be paid out of the residue, reserving the service due to his feudal lords. Debts owed to persons other than Jews are to be dealt with similarly. 12. No scootage or aid uh, may be levied in our kingdom without its general consent unless it is for the ransom of our uh, person to make our eldest son a knight and wants to marry our eldest daughter. For, though, for these purposes, only a reasonable aid may be levied. Aids from the City of London are to be treated similarly. 13. The City of London shall enjoy all its ancient liberties and free customs, both by land and by water. We also will and grant that all other cities, boroughs, towns, and ports shall enjoy all their liberties and free customs. 14. To obtain the general consent of the realm for the assessment of an aid, except in the three cases specified above, or a scutage, we will cause the archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, and greater barons to be summoned individually by letter to those who hold lands directly of us. We will cause a general summons to be issued through the sheriffs and other officials to come together on a fixed day of which at least 40 days notice shall be given and at a fixed place in all letters of summons the cause of the summons will be stated when a summons has been issued the business appointed for the day shall go forward in accordance with the resolution of those present even if not all those who were summoned have appeared so you're going to see things within this magna carta that you see in our law today in our court systems how it's supposed to work now we have uh, we have tarnished a lot of it, but you're going to find the very basis of what happens in our courts in the Magna Carta 1215. 15. In the future, we will allow no one to levy an aid from his fee men, uh, from his free men, except to ransom his person to make his eldest son a knight and wants to marry his eldest daughter. For these purposes, only a reasonable aid may be levied. 16. No man shall be forced to perform more service for a knight's fee or other free holding of land than is due from it. 17. Ordinary lawsuits shall not follow the royal court around, but shall be held in a fixed place. So you're also going to see when we get into Article 3 of the Constitution, and you're going to also hear Madison talk about it in the Bonnie Payments for Cod Fisheries Debate of 1792, that the courts were never supposed to be involved in all cases whatsoever. They were only supposed to be involved in certain cases. And so what we've got now, what do we have? We've got district court, we've got circuit court, we've got drug court, we've got family court, we've got probate court, we've got all these courts. And they're involved in every case whatsoever. And we're going to find out how that all happened in 1792. 18. Inquests of novel uh, uh, decision mort de, de ancestor or Darien presentment shall be taken only in their proper co uh, county court. We ourselves, uh, or in our absence abroad, our chief justice will send two justices to each county four times a year, and these justices with four knights of the county elected uh, by the county itself shall hold the ass uh, assizes in the county court on the day and in the place where the court meets. It used to be if someone was summoned to court, they'd have to go all the way to the king's court. They didn't, or what would happen is during martial law, the marshals would hold court 
and that's the only time they held court in the in the boroughs or the or the uh, shires. And so now they're setting up a system of courts that aren't just a central court, but courts that are around the country in the different shires, in the different places. So we're going to start seeing that in our court system where we have district courts and circuit courts. It gets its idea from here. If any assizes cannot be taken on the day of the county court, as many knights and freeholders shall afterwards remain behind of those who have attended the court, as will suffice for the administration of justice, having regard to the volume of business to be done. 20. For a trivial offense, a free man shall be fined only in proportion to the degree of his offense. Again, we start to see that the, the punishment should fit the crime. And for a serious offense, correspondingly, but not so heavily as to deprive him of his livelihood in the same way, a merchant shall be spared his merchandise and a, uh, hus and a husbandman the implements of his husbandry. If they fall upon the mercy of a royal court, none of these fines shall be imposed except by the assessment on oath of reputable men of the neighborhood. Again, you're going to see where a jury of your peers is not the way we do it today. A jury of your peers is supposed to be people who know the parties involved and understand those people, part of your neighborhood. We don't do that anymore. 21. Earls and barons shall be fined only by their equals and in proportion to the gravity of their offense. Again, a jury of your peers. If you're barons, you should set before barons. If you're a commoner, you should set before commoners. It should not be mixed. 22. A fine imposed upon the lay property of a clerk and holy orders shall be assessed upon the same principles without reference to the value of his ecclesiastical uh, benefice. 23. No town or person shall be forced to build bridges over rivers except those with an ancient obligation to do so. 24. No sheriff, constable, coroners, or other royal officials are to hold lawsuits that should be held by the royal justices. Again, it's, it separates the, the, the enforcers of the law should not be the judges of the law. So it, it kind of separates it out where we start, start to see a three different branches where you've got an executive, a legislative, and a judicial. Notice how they put coroners in there. Does anybody know uh, who can arrest the sheriff? Only the coroner can arrest the sheriff. Only who? Only the coroner. The FBI can't arrest him. The governor can't arrest him. Only the coroner can arrest him. 25. Every county, a hundred uh, weapon take and tithing shall remain at its ancient rent without increase except the royal demence manners. 26. If at the death of a man who holds a lay fee of the crown, a sheriff or royal official produces royal letters patent of summons for a debt due to the crown, it shall be lawful for them to seize and list movable goods found in the lay fee of the dead man to the value of the debt, again, making them whole again, not rich, only to the value of the debt, as assessed by worthy men. Nothing shall be removed until the whole debt is paid, when the residue shall be given over to the executors to, the, to carry out the dead man's will. If no debt is due to the crown, all the movable goods shall be regarded as the property of the dead man, except the reasonable shares of his wife and children. We kind of practice that today. If there's an estate, somebody passes away, there's a thing that we have to do called publishing. We publish that that estate um, anybody that has any debt against that estate has 30 days to produce that debt against that estate. After that estate is settled, if they try to come with that debt after that, they have lost their ability to collect on that debt. And so we see that same thing in the law here. 27. If a free man dies uh, uh, interstate, his movable goods are to be dis uh, distributed by his next of kin and friends under the supervision of the church. The rights of his debtors are to be uh, preserved. 28. No constable or other royal official shall take corn or other movable goods from any man without immediate payment unless the seller voluntarily offers post, uh, postponement of this. Um, 
we see this all the time. You'll see it in the movies where somebody jumps in and goes, I'm commandeering this vehicle. <laughs> no, you're not. It's private property. You're not going to do it without a warrant. So we start seeing that same idea here. 29, no constable may compel a knight to pay money for castle guard if the knight is willing to undertake the guard in person or with reasonable excuse to supply some other fit man to do it. A knight taken or sent on military service shall be excused from castle guard for the period of this service. 30, no sheriff, royal official, or other person shall take horses or carts for transport from any free man without his consent. Again, we start seeing that same thing uh, in our laws. 31, neither we nor any royal uh, official will take uh, wood for our castle or for any other purpose without the consent of the owner. 32, we will not keep the lands of people convicted of felony in our hand for longer than a year and a day, after which they shall be returned to the lords of the, uh, of the fees concerned. Again, we get this year and a day rule. We have that in our, in our, uh, in our current law, and that is uh, if you assault someone and within a year and a day, if they pass away, they can charge you with murder of that person. That's where that year and a day rule comes. 33, all fish, uh, all fish weirs shall be removed from the uh, Times and Medway and throughout the whole of England except on the sea coast. 34, the writ called uh, precipit shall not in future be issued to anyone in respect of any holding of land if a free man could thereby be deprived of the right of trial in his own Lord's court. There again we start to see due process. 35. There shall be standard measures of wine, ale, and corn, uh, the London Quarter, throughout the kingdom. There shall also be a standard width of dyed cloth, russet, and uh, haberject, namely uh, two L's within the... Uh, Selvages. Yeah. Sledges? Selvages. Sel Selvages. Selvages. Yeah. Weights are to be uh, st standardized similarly. Again, we start seeing where in Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 1 through 18, it says that Congress has the ability to set weights and measures uh, across the several states, right? This is so that mercantilism or trade is fair. So we start seeing the same thing. Where did they get it from? They didn't dream it up. They got it from their experience. 36, in future, nothing shall be paid or accepted for the issue of a writ of inquisition of life or limb. It shall be given uh, gratis and not refused. Not refused. 37, if a man holds land of the, uh, of the crown by free farm, uh, sockage or uh, burgage, and also holds the land of someone else for knight's service, we will not have guardianship of his heir, nor of the land that belongs to the other person's uh, fee. By virtue of the fee farm, uh, sockage or burgage, unless the uh, fee farm owes knight's service. We will not have the guardianship of a man's heir or of the land that he holds of someone else by reason of any small property that that he may hold of the crown for a service of knives, arrows, or the like. So, the uh, weapons dealers. <laughs> 38. In future, no official shall place a man on trial upon his own unsupported <coughs> statement without producing credible witnesses to the truth of it. This is why, um, you know, the police only have the ability to be on your property with certain few exceptions. One is if they're serving papers, they can be on your property legally. If they're serving a warrant, they can be on your property legally. If they are invited, they can be on your property <coughs> legally. If they have a signed complaint, they can be on your property legally. One of the things I hate hearing all the time is when I watch these videos and they go, well, we had a 911 call, so we're, I'm, okay, so you had a 911 call. Where's your signed complaint? Do you know why it's important to have that signed complaint? Because I am not supposed to make a complaint that isn't in truth and fact. If I do it using the courts or using the police to get even with my neighbor that I don't like, and I make false statements, 
I should be charged for those false statements. That's why I have to sign it with my name. I have to sign the complaint with my name, stating under the penalty of perjury that these are the facts and that these, are, that these facts are true. And if they find out that those facts aren't true, then I can be charged. So this idea that, well, we had a 911 complaint. I'm sorry, where's your signed complaint? If you don't have a signed complaint, you have nothing. Is there a limit, time limit, to the amount of time you can be there without? No, there's, there's no time limit. But they have to have a signed complaint. 